Praise God, I would invite you to sit down for a moment. I have a few things to say. Uh, so glad you are with us. Welcome to Southwest Community Church. Uh, we are a family of families, so welcome to our family. If you are new or if you are visiting, welcome in. So glad everyone is here. Uh, we love to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, we exist for the glory of God and for the fame of of Jesus. So thank you for being here. I uh, just want to celebrate and say thank you uh, for a couple of things. First of all, yesterday was our free for all. So if you helped and donated for the free for all, or we, I think we had over about uh, around 50 volunteers uh, that helped pull that off. Thank you so much for that. We had hundreds of people on our property yesterday. Uh, it's a good way for us just to reach out to our community, to give back to the community. Uh, everything uh, that was on this property uh, went out for free, so it was fun watching uh, uh, these families load up trucks.
trunks and the back seats of their car and just uh, bless them with all kinds of stuff. Uh, the, important, uh, the important statistic though, especially on Cinco de Mayo, is we did hand out over 250 breakfast burritos uh, yesterday. So uh, if you missed it, uh, you need to be here uh, next year for that. Uh, it, was, it was a great day. So thank you for volunteering. Thank you for being part of that. Also want to say thank you for the uh, search team. We've had a search team uh, looking for a, a permanent full-time uh, worship director, and there will be a big announcement next Sunday, so make sure you're here for that. We are on the brink of uh, uh, introducing someone uh, to the congregation and doing a candidating uh, weekend, so that will be announced uh, next week, but I do want to thank uh, the search team and the elders uh, for being part of that process. Uh, there will be an announcement next week, and this went out in our weekly email, but um, if you haven't been around or haven't seen, our church continues to grow. Last couple of weeks, especially the first service is just packed. We don't have room. So we are saying goodbye to the tables in the back uh, so that we can set up more chairs and, uh, and have uh, more seating in this room. Uh, but if you are a family, a family with kids, uh, I know the tables started during COVID to spread people out. And uh, it's, it's also been a wonderful way for us to welcome families if family want to sit there. We still want to be sensitive to our families, so families feel free uh, to sit in the chairs, bring your kids. We still will offer our family worship guide for that. Or if you must, must, must have a table, uh, there's tables out in the Welcome Center and the, the monitors will be on, so that'll be kind of an overflow. But we just wanted to give the church a heads up uh, this week that next week uh, there will be no tables. So if you need to mourn on your way out this morning over a table, uh, yeah, you have all the freedom. Uh, to do so. Uh, I'm also happy to say Maya is back with us. She's been gone for three weeks. Can we welcome Maya back? Thank you for welcoming her back. Uh, love that she's back. Uh, she's been uh, spending time with some of our missionaries in Nigeria using the gifts and abilities and talents that God has given her to use in Nigeria. So I want you to look at the video. We'll just give you a little glimpse of what she's been up to uh, the last three weeks um, so that if you want to talk to her afterwards and just ask her about uh, her ministry, you can. But just check out this video. Yeah, you can clap for that. Yeah, yeah, it's wonderful. Um, yeah, so it's, it's really exciting to be a part of church that understands the gospel uh, is global. And, uh, and we exist for the gospel of Jesus Christ globally. And I know we send a lot of people all over uh, the world uh, with the good news. Uh, we have a couple trips coming up even this summer. We have a trip to Poland and a trip to Nigeria. Pray 
pray for those trips um, as people spread the good news of the gospel uh, from our church. It's, it's really exciting. And obviously, I know many of you as parents and grandparents that have kids serving the Lord uh, in this country and around the globe, it just warms your heart. And so for me as a dad, really fun to watch that. So good to have Maya back. Uh, but I would ask for your prayers because uh, she did receive five proposals while she was away. Uh, so I'm going to be working through the applications and uh, evaluating those this week. Uh, be in prayer for me as I do that. Uh, I would invite you to stand with us as we continue uh, to prepare our hearts for worship uh, this morning. We like to do so by reading scripture and praying aloud together. This month we're going to be focusing on Psalm 128. I'll, I'll read the regular text. Please join me with the bold text. Psalm 128 as we prepare our hearts for worship. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. Please join me. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed and it shall be well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. That passage reminds us all to be men and women who first and foremost fear the Lord, to hold him worthy of our praise, to, to acknowledge his holiness, to acknowledge his perfection. So in light of our fear for the Lord, because he is a mighty God, let's prepare our hearts with a moment of silent prayer as we come into this worship service. If you've walked into this room with unrepented sin, I'd encourage you, this is a time to repent of that sin. It's also a time for you just to get rid of the distractions and to focus on him so that we come to his word with pure hearts, with hearts ready to hear what God has for us today. So let's just have a moment of silent prayer together. Let's do that together. So dear God, as we come into this space, we do so honoring a holy, righteous, perfect God, God of the universe that is the giver and sustainer of life, sovereign over all, all powerful, all knowing, everywhere present with us. You are the God that we worship. You are the God that we live our lives for the glory of. And today, as we focus on communion, we are grateful for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus. That you took on human form to come to this earth, to live that perfect life, to die that substitutionary death on the cross so that we may have life and we may have it more abundantly. And so as we remember the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you and we praise you. Continue to build your church in this place. And today, may we love one another well. May we see you for who you are. And may we walk out just a little more intimate with you, knowing you just a little better, deeper in love with you so that we can be lights in a dark world. Pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Join us as we sing this morning. is cool. 
have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a dream from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar.
just come before your throne this morning and just embrace your loving arms right there with us. We just thank you for your grace over us. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice on the cross to save us and to replace what should have been ours, God. We just thank you for your truth, for your grace, and for your love. Help us to surrender ourselves to you each and every day. We thank you for who you are, God. We worship you this morning. In Jesus' name. You were the word at the beginning. When we got the love most high. You hid in glory in creation. Now we Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you
Good morning, Southwest family. It is so good to see all of you. I don't know about you, but um, I was a little caught off guard because I realized that it's already May. <laughs> yeah, if that snuck up on you, it did to me as well, but I got to celebrate some uh, Star Wars Day yesterday and now Cinco de Mayo. And uh, what a beautiful Sunday morning it is that we get to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Scott Riley, and I serve as our student director here at the church. So if you have high schoolers or middle schoolers um, in your family, they can come and hang out with me on Wednesday nights or on Sunday mornings at 10. We'd love to have them there. Um, but I, uh, I want to just share with you, um, I am so glad to um, see all of you here this morning. I want to welcome you. And for those who are joining us online, thank you so much for tuning in, getting on your device, and worshiping with us this morning. It is so good to see all of you. Um, as a church, we do want to be a family. We are connected to one another through Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he made for us on the cross. And that makes us the family of God. But in order to be a family, you have to actually get to know somebody else in that family. And so I'm going to give you that opportunity to shake each other's hands, give each other a hug, say hi to one another. So take a moment to do that this morning. I gave you. As you are making your way back to your seat, sounds like there's a lot of great conversations happening. Thanks for actually interacting with other people this morning. I want to direct you guys to a few resources that are available to you this morning. Uh, the first one that you'll see coming down your rows is the register, and it's in this little booklet kind of thing. So don't be scared when you see it. But this is an opportunity for you to fill out some information on um, a card inside to let us know who you are if you haven't done that before. And at the very bottom, you have an opportunity to fill out a prayer request. And I think this is a really cool thing and really important thing. And it allows for our staff to pray for you over things that might be going on in your life that you would like prayer for. So I'd encourage you um, to write a prayer request at the bottom so um, your staff can pray for you in that way and encourage you in different ways as well. Another resource that you might have gotten when you walked through the, the doors was a sermon guide. On the front, it gives you a few things that are coming up on our calendar, and on the back, gives you a little bit of a walkthrough of what our sermon will be and allows you to fill out some blanks and write some notes. Um, if you did not receive one of these as you came through the door, there's an opportunity right now for you to get one. So please raise your hand, and one of our ushers will actually put one of these in your hand if you do not get it. Um, so please leave your hand in the air so they can see you, and one will get into your hand shortly. Another resource that is available to our families this morning is our Family Sunday Worship guide or packet. And it kind of looks like this. Um, you may already know to grab one when you come in, but maybe you don't. So if you're a family and you have kids and would like for them to follow along and participate in this morning's sermon, uh, please go grab one of these. It's right there. There's a box in the back of the auditorium that you can go and grab one of these um, or raise your hand as well and someone could get you one of those too. Uh, but this is a great way for our kids to participate in the service this morning. And so I'd encourage you to grab one of those. And as we uh, continue in worshiping our God this morning, um, I want to spend some time praying over Pastor Than, who will be sharing God's word this morning. God, we thank you for just the beautiful day that you've given us today, the opportunity and privilege to come before you and worship you, to give you the honor and praise that you deserve. God, this is the day that you have made, and we will rejoice in it. So thank you, God, that we can participate 
and, uh, and to give our praise and glory to you this morning. I just do pray over Pastor Than as he brings your word this morning, as he shares what you have laid on his heart. I pray that you would speak through him by your spirit with power and that you would give us soft hearts to hear what you have to say to us this morning and to be transformed by it. So go before him as he comes up and shares from your word. We ask this in your name. Amen. Doesn't that intro just make you want to dance just a little bit? All right. Every time I hear it, I'm like, ah! (laughs) Created things. Created things by their very being and nature give praise to God. They do so naturally and continually what we as humans actually have to decide to do. Each Sunday, we as humans decide to come here to church. There's some level of deciding that we're going to enter into the praise of our God. Our praise to God is to go far beyond just a Sunday morning setting. It's actually to be part of our lives. And maybe you've seen that glorious sunrise, or maybe you've seen that mountain vista, or maybe you've seen the crashing waves. And your response is to say, wow, God, what you make is amazing. But God is no less present in the office that's filled with desks, chairs, books. Throughout scripture, creation and created things are used to help us understand the depth and the richness of God. And in turn, turn and give praise to God, not to give praise to the created thing. Think through scripture for a moment. A garden in Adam and Eve, a rainbow and Noah, a ram and a thicket and Abraham, the Ebenezer stone and Samuel, the Ark of the Covenant and the Israelites. In honor of using created things to help us understand depth and richness, you'll notice a color coordinating of sorts with the slides this morning. Our hope is that this adds to the richness of understanding our very creative God. There are also specific times in scripture where God attaches a word of promise to a created thing. Specifically, God assigns special meaning to his word, the Bible. He attached very special meaning to baptism, and he also attached special meaning to the Lord's Supper. Today, we're going to explore the richness and depth of the Lord's Supper. Throughout the sermon, you'll hear me use the phrase the Lord's Supper and communion somewhat interchangeably, so both mean the same thing as I talk this morning. In our modern context, the Lord's Supper can be just a passing, pointless ritual that we cram in, or it can become a really creepy practice of cannibalism. The Lord's Supper becomes a pointless ritual when we have to cram it in that end of the service and we're not really thinking about it. It's like, oh, there's that cracker, there's that juice, let's go. Or it can become that weird cannibalism thing when we misunderstand. When we misunderstand the beauty that confirms and nourishes us as believers. Our goal today is to explore the beauty and depth of the Lord's Supper together so that we're all the more intentional every time we take the bread and we take the cup as an ordinance that we celebrate together as a family. This practice was first instituted by Jesus with his disciples near the end of his public ministry shortly before he was crucified. You can find this practice in Matthew 26, 26 through 29, Mark 14, 22 through 25, Luke 22, 15 through 23, and it's even talked about long before it's instituted in John 6, 51 through 58, and even preceding that. 
All of these record aspects of the Lord's Supper. Our primary focus will be on Luke with some John as well. Luke 22, 15 starts with Jesus saying these words. I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Before he gets to starting the Lord's Supper, he says, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And in that phrase, he's pointing to a majorly significant biblical event in the Old Testament. Exodus 11 and 12 record this particular event. If you remember, the Israelites had been turned into slaves in Egypt after 400 years. They got down there because Joseph had his family come down after a famine. So 400 years later, they are now hanging out in Egypt. They've become slaves, and God sends Moses in to rescue them. But Pharaoh, the leader of Egypt, is extraordinarily stubborn and does not listen. So God sends plagues. And the last plague is the Passover. Exodus chapter 12, starting in verse 1, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's house, a lamb for a household. Jump to verse six, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then you shall take some of the blood and put it on the doorposts of your house and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. In this manner you shall eat it with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand. You shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land in Egypt. And when you come to the land that the Lord your God will give you as he promised, you shall keep this service. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say to them, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, for he passed over the houses of the people of Israel when he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshiped. Note, even at this event, as it was occurring in history, God was setting it up to become an annual remembrance that would specifically teach children that God rescues his people. The end of verse 27, the end Verse 27 in chapter 12 tells us our response, at least what it should be. It was the people's response, worship God. So when Jesus refers to the Passover with his disciples, that's what he's remembering with them together. Jesus then adds deeper and fuller meaning when he starts the practice of the Lord's Supper. Back to Luke 22, moving on to verse 16. Jesus says, for I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup, and when he'd given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they'd eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Keep in mind that Jesus is saying these words to the disciples, and they have all the meaning of Passover pulsing through their memories. Verse 16 says it is the last time he's going to eat the Passover meal with his disciples until fulfillment. Now imagine for a moment, after service today, you head out for a meal, and when you're out at the meal, whoever is in charge stands up mid-meal and announces, this is the last meal I'm eating with you until the plan's done. It, it'd get everybody's attention. You're not eating with us anymore? We go out to Red Robin every Sunday. What do you mean? Jesus was telling them that this was super 
important. And it was to be remembered because it wasn't gonna happen again until they were back together when the plan was completed. All of these words should have made bells and whistles go off in the disciples' heads and that's exactly what happened. Look at what we're still doing. It's super important. To this day, we remember through the practice of communion. Jesus took the bread and thanked God for it. He broke it apart and gave it to his disciples, and he told them that this was his body given for them. Eat it to remember that Jesus' body was given for them. He took the wine and he gave it to them, and he said this is to be consumed. It's the new covenant of my blood. Think back to the lamb of Passover that we just discussed. A perfect little lamb was selected and killed. That lamb's blood was put on the doorframe of the house. Then they ate the lamb. The lamb that was killed and eaten by them was used to show them that God was going to protect them, pass over them. Now Jesus is telling them that he is going to have his blood spilled and they're going to eat his body. He is directly pointing back to all the significance of Passover. They ate the lamb, his body. He is claiming the position of the lamb, the sacrificial lamb from Passover. He is claiming the lamb's blood as his own. Think about the deep impactful meaning that he was instituting with a group of Jewish people that very clearly knew and very clearly celebrated Passover. He's telling his disciples that he is their protector, that he saves their lives. This is ground shaking. This is redefining. This is a monumentally shifting moment in Jewish culture. Jesus fulfills this when he dies, beats death, and rises again. Think back. When Jesus dies, the very earth we stand on shakes. In our modern culture, we can oftentimes plow through our celebration of communion, not taking into account the deep richness that is inside of the words of Jesus. We've been exploring so far the significance and richness of communion. We must now confront the fact that this practice is not creepy cannibalism. It's a misinterpretation That has been battled against. This misinterpretation was battled against all the way back in Jesus' day. Earlier, we talked about the places in the gospel where the Lord's Supper was talked about. And before Jesus ever gets to the Lord's Supper, he's teaching in Capernaum. And as he teaches in Capernaum, he's interacting with this group of people in a synagogue. And he's traveled, and he's just done some miracles. Listen to the exchange here. See if you can pick up on Jesus' push to get them to understand When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. So they said to him, then what sign will you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. But my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall not thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. 
And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I'll raise him up on the last day. So the Jews grumbled about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I, come, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I'll raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your, father ate the man, your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever, and the bread that I give for, life, for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I'll raise him up on the last day, for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Do you hear the exchange? Do you hear the tension that's going on there? They want some more bread, by the way, they just got fed. So they're like, ah, oh, Jesus, do it again. Instead, he's like, no, 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 we're gonna teach you. We may have fed you, but now we're really gonna feed you in this passage. Jesus completes the picture that exists when we partake in the Lord's Supper. One of the key pieces in this passage is from verse 35, as Jesus states that it is, that it is in the coming and believing that one is eating and drinking of Christ. It is in the coming and believing that one is eating and drinking of Christ. He follows it up in verse 56 when he says, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me. Another way to say this is those that come to Jesus and believe in who he truly is will remain and be with Jesus forever. The Lord's Supper physically commemorates that. There's no cannibalism in the Lord's Supper, just profound meaning. The goal in continuing to take communion is to give us a physical thing to do that reminds us all the more fully than just words or a conversation might remind us. The other goal is to look back, back to Passover, and to look forward to the marriage feast of the Lamb. Let's return to the Luke passage before you get caught up in the turkey picture. Back to Luke 22, 16, when Jesus says, I will not eat of this until it is fulfilled. Remember that Jesus is waiting to celebrate the full, complete plan. When Jesus says in the kingdom of God, at the end of that, I won't do this until I'm in the kingdom of God, Jesus is pointing to all the richness that we get to catch a glimpse of, and that glimpse comes from Revelation 19 and 21 and 22. Revelation 19, starting in verse 6, then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, hallelujah, for the Lord our God almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine, bright linen, fine, bright linen that's pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Fast forward into 21. 
Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like the most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. Fast forward to 21, and the 12 gates were 12 pearls, each gate made of a single pearl, and the streets of the city were pure gold, like transparent glass. And I saw no need, no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, there's the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And night will be no more. They will need no light or lamp or sun, for the Lord will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. This is the beauty that is in the words, the kingdom of God. When Jesus says, this is my body which is given for you, he is telling us he is the true sacrificial lamb that the lambs of Passover are pointing to. When Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me, he is telling us we are to remember through words, through physical bread eaten, and through actual drink consumed. He knows since he made us that remembrance and richness is built through words and physical action. When Jesus says this, cup poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood, he is saying the old covenant was not the full picture when a lamb's blood was put on the doorposts. The full picture is when I, Jesus, die for you and forgive you of your sins and when you're with me for eternity. The picture of the turkey behind me is to evoke the idea of the marriage feast of the lamb. It is almost as if Jesus knew he could get to us through our stomachs. <laughs> the richness of communion points back to Passover and forward to the marriage feast of the Lamb when all those that believe and follow Jesus feast with him for eternity. Today, as we share in this remembrance together, I encourage you not to race through it. I invite you instead to think through each of the words that Jesus spoke when he instituted the practice. Today, as we celebrate communion together, take time to take in that richness. Some of that richness can be even better understood through a Jewish mindset around the sharing of a meal, specifically a festival meal. The Passover was one of those festivals. You know, I grew up in the 80s and 90s in evangelical churches, and it's hard for me to grasp the full implications of what I've so easily passed over for years. While it was the practice in my home to thank God for food, while it was the practice to thank God in churches, a lot of the deep richness of a Jewish culture and what they saw during a festival meal or during times of thanksgiving was lost on me. When Paul and the Gospels tell us that Jesus took the bread, blessed it, and broke it, it is important to realize that these three concepts, these terms, are part of the ordinary Jewish table blessing. The Jewish blessing was more than perfunctory. It wasn't like ours were like, okay, Jesus, thanks for the food, love the smell of the pizza, can't wait to get it in my tummy. You guys know. It was more than perfunctory. It was an important ritual of faith. When the bread was raised and broken, the blessing or thanksgiving that was spoken carried the idea of God's good gift. Jesus' words go even deeper when he prayed them in the Last Supper. The blessing was about the whole 
meal. I know when we practice today, we got a little cracker and we got a little juice. But when it was first instituted, it was attached to a whole meal and there was great Jewish significance. When Jesus took the bread and blessed it, he was blessing the whole meal. And he was doing something rather remarkable with the individuals that were at that meal. Isolated individuals were drawn into a single community through the sharing of a meal together. For ancient people, the meal itself established a bond for those that shared the meal. It didn't merely symbolize the bond, but actually constituted it. So in blessed and broken bread, the whole meal was consecrated, and in its share, a community was formed. Now let's take that idea of community being formed through a meal and compare it to what goes on in a Sunday morning service here in this room. When we gather as God's people during the Sunday service, we all come together here as individuals. We gather because we've said it's worth our time. Old, young, married, single, baby, toddler, elementary age, teen, college, young career, newlyweds, families with no children, families with many children, those who've never married, those who've lost their spouses, those who are growing old together, those who are just plain growing old. Every person, every person is invited to gather. Think about what happens when we sing. As we sing together, we sing together as a way to unite us before a holy God. When we read scripture together on the screen, we read scripture together as a way to unite us together before a holy God. When we open God's word together, it's as a way to unite us before a holy God. And when we share communion, it's a way to unite us together before a holy God. When we take the Lord's Supper, it is a picture of us taking Jesus in, just like we did when we initially chose to follow Jesus and submit to his rule and reign in our lives. Today, in a short time, you'll be invited to make your way to the communion tables around the edge of the room. As you do, I invite you to do something very different. I know out of respect, this is what I see most often. And I'm okay with that, but I'm gonna break it. Here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. I'm gonna ask you to lift your head and look at other people in the eye as a way to unite us together before a holy God. I'm gonna ask you to use this thing called your mouth and smile as you pass other people as a way to unite us together before a holy God. I might even so bold as to ask you to say hello as a way to unite us together before a holy God. You know, if you arrived in the same car this morning, there's most likely something occurred when you walked into this room, and actually it happens from the moment they leave the cars to the building. I watch sometimes, it's called clump movement. Have you seen it? They move into the room here, they all sit together. Okay, I can make fun of my own family because it's a very big rhythm. Second uh, second row right there, first service. That's where they always are. It's a clump movement. Okay, they do it. You guys know. Okay. But what about if you don't have a clump? What if you arrived alone? Y'all, I'm gonna encourage you. When you have a chance to read this passage from Luke, it'll be up on the screen. Read it together. When you go get the elements, come back to your chairs and look around for those that might not have driven here in a clump and celebrate communion together as a way to unite us before a holy God. Here we practice open communion Open communion means that if you truly believe that Jesus died for you and paid for your sins and beat death, this is your time to partake and to remember. 
The reason that we reserve taking the Lord's Supper for only those who believe that Jesus is the Savior is because of how profound and meaningful Jesus' death and resurrection truly are. 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 29 says, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup, for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Paul's telling us this is super important. It's super meaningful, and it should only be shared by those that are confessing Jesus as Lord and Savior. This is also the reason we give you time to think, commune, reflect, confess. Parents, We want you to take communion, the Lord's Supper seriously, and the responsibility therein, and not just say, oh sure kids, you can have a cracker and some juice. Instead, we ask that you wait for your children to respond and follow Jesus as Lord and Savior. And if they're not there yet, have them wait. Instead, look at the Luke passage. Go back to it. Read it together. It'll be on the screen. Talk to them about what we just talked about. Open up the family worship guide. Flip through the pages. There's lots of help in there. Explain to them what's going on, and who knows? God may use your explanation to draw your children to himself. Explain to your children that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. Explain to your children that They deserve death because they fall short. But God died in their place, Romans 6, 23. Ask them if they want to follow Jesus. Talk to them about what that means. Pray with them. If this is too much for you, the Family Worship Guide has a whole two pages about how to lead your child to Christ in it. Also, If you're in this room and you're not sure that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, man, just don't take it. Instead, slow down and say, hey, do I understand this? Do I want this? Do I want to follow Jesus? I've never decided to, but I think I might. Well, at the back of this room, staff members will be waiting there, and they want you to walk up to them and say, look, I'm trying to figure out this Jesus person. Can you help And they'll say, hey, where do you want to start? And then you're off to the conversational races. They'd love to talk with you. They'd love to interact with you. It would be their privilege to come alongside you. As we take communion, there will be a song playing, and the song is playing because, well, I found the words sort of like a summary of what we've been talking about. Let me share them with you. Behold the lamb who bears our sins away, slain for us, and we remember the promise made that all who come in faith find forgiveness at the cross, so we share in this bread and we drink of his sacrifice as a sign of our bonds of peace around the table of the king. The body of our Savior Jesus Christ torn for you, eat and remember. The wounds that heal, the death that brings us life paid the price to make us one. So we share in this bread of life and we drink of his sacrifice as a sign of our bonds of love around the table of the king. The blood that cleanses every stain shed for you drink and remember he drained death's cup that all may enter in to receive the life of God. So we share in this bread of life and we drink of his sacrifice as a sign of our bonds of grace around the table of the king. And so with thankfulness and faith, we rise to respond and to remember our call to follow in the steps of Christ as his body here on earth, as we share in his suffering. We proclaim Christ will come again and will join in the feast of heaven around the table of our King. There are eight stations around this room. If you're unable and it's just too hard to get there, Just shoot your hand in the air. We would find it an honor to come and serve you communion today. The Luke passage, Luke 22, 16 through 20, will be on the screen behind me. Take some time. Read through it. Reflect. Don't rush. 
And then remember, on your way up to the table, smile, look at each other in the eyes, because we're united together in Christ before our holy God. our sins away slain for us and we remember the promise made that all who come in faith find forgiveness at the cross so we share in this bread for us and the life that we have through you Jesus we just give you honor and glory that is do your name we celebrate the life that we have in you and our relationship with you God we just thank you and praise you for who you are we worship you we celebrate what you have done and what you will continue to do help us to surrender our lives to you each and every day and use this time as a time of remembrance and a celebration to look forward to your return and for coming. We thank you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Before we sing the last song, just a quick reminder, we will have prayer partners here at the front of the stage. If you would like more prayer for anything or just someone to talk to, they are more than happy to talk with you and pray over you uh, for whatever you need. So let's stand and worship together as we close.